everyone quiet on the set places places we've got a show to make here our Chris and Gabriel they are okay everyone in three two one and coming to you live from sunny Orlando Florida it's the great movie radio show a movie talk podcast starring Chris and Gabe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Great Movie Radio hey guys, Show. This is Chris Schneider, and we are coming to you from Orlando, Florida. And we've got a wonderful guest that Gabe's going to introduce us to today. Yeah, uh, he didn't want me to new say episode. this, but the ever so vocally talented Mr. Jack Thomas. Welcome to the show, Jack. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Thanks for being on, Jack. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about your favorite films. We've got a top five list from you and then the genres that are on the ride. And we're going to kind of recreate in our segment we like to call Around the Track. So we're going to have fun. Yeah, this is Gabe's, Gabe's second episode as co-host. So our bantering. Well, Chris, you is, know, I, I told you about it so. earlier. Um, you know, Gabe was one of my trainers. Mm, it was. It was. I remember he sang yeah. uh, Phantom in the Opera one night in the break room for me. I think I I, re, I don't know if I was there or if I heard the story, but I remember Jack being connected to the Phantom of the Opera in the break room. It's like the <laughs> clue. It's Jack was singing with, with that the in the break room. Gabe <laughs> so, was there when I the was trainer, uh, exactly. I was I was forced to go live my first time. I remember, yeah, I remember you were training there with us. Jack uh, was a leader with us at Great Movie Ride, who came into our area and trained while uh, both Gabe and I were working there. He has experience on movie ride, but he also has experience at multiple other attractions because he was but, he was a leader in our area, not just that our you know it was so cool for me. Um, I'll I'll go off on a little tangent here real quick. When I found out I was going to Icon and and knowing GMR was inside of that, um, man, I was humbled. I really was. Uh, that attraction meant so much to my family and I. When we first brought our daughter. I was actually, I, I was on my first tour out of Nashville. We we came to Orlando to do this big music conference and we got over uh, to, to Hollywood studios and, uh, and it, my daughter was so young and so small. She, she, you know, that was, that was our e-ticket attraction at Hollywood studios. We couldn't, we couldn't do the other stuff without her. And, um, I remember playing it forward years later and remembering how how all of the cast members back then had impacted us so much. You know, it became our, our staple attraction at Hollywood Studios. So when I found out I was going to be managing that ride, I... I, I was I was humbled. Um, I was I, I will tell you I was to tears because that attraction is so special to me. It always has been. It always will be. It's even sitting here in, in in my office, the the one picture on the wall right next to my computer screen is the reopening picture from May 29th of 2015, and uh, the one we took out front. I, I took that postcard and I went and bought a frame. And I had as many of the cast members at that time sign that picture. You know, Gabe, Gabe I, I see your I see your signature right there. Yeah, I remember yeah. that day like it was yesterday. <laughs> it was uh, yeah, Jen Romano, Miss uh, Miss Legacy. There's there's just uh, so many so many cool signatures here. So I, I just wanted you all to know that. So being invited here, it 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 means a ton to me. I remember like during training, you talked about how like proud you were to work there and all that stuff. And it definitely showed. And, you know, even though you were humbled, I, I was ready to throw you on that live show. I'm just like, you just got to do it, man. You got to do it. I will <laughs> never forget Jig, Skippy, Harry, Zippy, Dinky, and all the rest. I just <laughs> never, oh, man. ever. I, I still remember segments of the spiel. I, and I find myself, uh, I find myself driving across 528 when I'm going to work. Uh, sometimes and I'll, I'll start running through it just cause I, I never want to forget. That. <laughs> I don't even remember what I had for breakfast That's this fine. morning. Oh wait, I didn't have breakfast this morning. 
<laughs> what is the concept? Wait, of it's time. Like, what day is it? What is going right? on? Uh, you have The Godfather and Godfather 2 on there. On my podcast, those are the movies I talked about I've never seen. But um, I was talking to Chris earlier. I have not seen any of your top five favorite movies. Oh, my. Okay. What do you want to know? Just wh- why are they your favorite? Uh, <laughs> start with Gone with the Wind. Um, you know, Gone with the Wind, it was, it was actually one of the first movies I ever saw. And um, ironically, uh, well, I, I, yeah, I guess ironically, um, you know, I went through – I went through all of my uh, all of my education uh, up through high school graduation and um, had only ever read one book fully. Uh, so and it was gone with the wind. And, and I just I, you know, the story was incredible. Um, it, it told about a really difficult time in our history, which I love history. And I, I mean, it, it really did change how movies were made at that time. It set the standard and. Uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, when you combine a, a great story, great cinematography, um, incredible costuming, um, some pretty decent actors, and uh, and you take all of that and put a great movie score underneath of it, adds, it, it just all adds up into that movie. That's awesome. It's funny. It, well, it's funny you say like the history and like a troubled time, and and like I immediately just thought like I wonder if like you know. Years from now, somebody's going to make a movie about quarantine and, you know, all that stuff. But didn't Dustin Hoffman do one already? Kind of like that. You, you know, you may be right. My movie knowledge isn't as good as yours or Chris's. So. I, yeah, I, think it's on, I actually think it's on uh, It's on Hulu right now. Or no, not Hulu. It's on Netflix right now. Oh, I may have Outbreak, to check it out. I think, yeah, Outbreak or something like that. You're talking about, yeah, uh, Wolfgang Peterson, 1995, with Dustin Hoffman, Rene Russo, yeah. Morgan for Wow, yeah. this cast, it's got everybody. Dustin Hoffman, Rene Russo, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Spacey, yeah, whatever. Cuba Gooding Jr., Donald Sutherland, Patrick Dempsey, and they're wearing the quarantine suits. Look at that. Awesome. There's maybe, I may yeah, check it out once we get out. back to normal. I don't know if I want to watch that as I'm in quarantine and freak my stuff out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a little too, too close. To <laughs> a little too close. I might find myself afterwards crying in the corner of my shower. Oh yeah. So you, I, I take it you haven't watched Contagion while all this is going on because that one Steven Soderbergh did years ago. That one's been a popular one to watch during the courts, or at least when it first started. I think Contagion was a very yeah, popular I keep film. Yeah, with, to watch, uh, so. with stuff like that, especially like I keep wanting to watch Parasite, but then I'm like, also maybe I don't. I don't know. No, that one. That one's more of a okay. social okay. thing, kind of like a society versus a <laughs> pandemic. So that one's appropriate. I'm loving it. Still. <laughs> awesome, awesome. We'll combine the next two: Godfather one and two. Like great movies. Like I haven't seen them fully, like little bits and pieces, and they're definitely on my list. But like, what about it? Like, makes it your favorite? Okay, so so. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I I was living in Youngstown, Ohio. And um, while we were in Ohio, uh, a gentleman, I'm not going to mention names, uh, but a gentleman, um, his granddaughter was getting married and I was asked to sing at the wedding. What I didn't know is that the gentleman was, um, he was a family member. As a matter of fact, he was a family leader. Mm. And, uh, and, and I remember you know, knowing the story, I, I, I remember going to the, uh, to, to, to the rehearsal dinner and it was a scene out of, out of, uh, out of Godfather, the original, uh, we walk into this room and I mean, everything's like dark walls, dark paneling, <laughs> red, red carpeting, I guess. <laughs> so you can see stains. Um, and, uh, and, but the scariest part was we had to walk through the kitchen to get back to this private room for this reception. And what I really realized quickly was that there were no windows and no, no other doors to get into that room. And I thought, man, this is not cool. Um, so <laughs> anyway, anyway um, no, you know, Godfather, I, I think, I, I, you know, a, a movie quotes when, when you think about um, that are iconic and famous. Um, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. I mean, come on. that that's It's a prolific statement. And and to watch, you know, when, when you look at Michael and, and his evolution through, and, and I only talk about one and two because I wish they never made three. You watch how he evolves and, and his family 
and how they respond to him different. And you see these moments with his older brother where he kind of teases him, like, you know, oh, look at you, you want to get your hands dirty. What are you trying to do here? It's just, it's, it's this family element, actual blood family. It's the mafia family evolution and the politicking and the moving around. And I mean, that, that movie was just shot absolutely perfect. I, there's nothing I would change about those two. That's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, like, like I said, I've never seen the movies, but obviously it, like you said, it has one of the most famous line, lines in movie hit, like cinema. And oh, yeah, it's, it's just like awesome. And everybody knows whether you've seen it or not, you've seen the like parodies and spoofs of it. And you've seen that scene where you sit there and it's a dark room and the, the shades are closed behind. It's very dim lit. And there he is just the Godfather just sitting there up. Well, and, you know, the, the one scene where Michael finally goes and he's going to avenge when his father got shot and he's he's going to he's going to do this. He's going to get his hands dirty for the first time in the family business. And then he's going to bolt to Italy for a while to hide. But you're sitting there in that in that restaurant with them, in that diner with them. And you nothing said you just watch people's facial expressions and the way that the music builds and then all of a sudden you hear the the train car going by and and i you know you watch that it, my heart rate goes up because the intensity you feel it so hard i mean it's just crazy yeah my, that's awesome my, my hands are sweating a little bit thinking about it i just you know awesome yeah um so we will jump into the next movie the Shawshank Redemption, Morgan Freeman, great movie. Again, only seeing bits and pieces of it. Haven't seen the full movie. Yeah, I, this you know this was one of those movies also that when I look back and God, I've, I've watched it now so many times. Um, as a matter of fact, and then um, uh, Castle Rock uh, that I one of the shows I currently watch, um, you know, started from this whole Shawshank Redemption. They even they even film uh, the television show. Um, it starts in season one in in Shawshank Prison. So it, it's it's a pretty cool you know continuation of the story. They even make reference to the the bullet hole from the when the uh, the warden shot himself uh, in the office. So I you know remembering my first time you know Morgan's his narration his storytelling ability throughout that whole movie it's calming I you know I at at one point in time you guys know this I I actually worked inside of a prison after I got out of the military um for a couple of years it, it was you know I I saw so much truth in those scenes you know there's things that go on inside that they did not skirt those issues they were very forthcoming in the script with it um and and you know just to see andy i mean you know we all ended up finding out he, he didn't do it and he still found a way uh, even one of morgan uh, freeman's lines uh in the movie he talks about when he saw andy walking through you know the courtyard there at the prison he was the man was walking like he didn't have a care in the world, you know, and I it's I, I can only imagine how difficult that would be in that situation that that's I yeah, I, I can't imagine. it. But I, I, you know, I look at that again, the time period of that movie, you know, I, I love that point in American history. Um, you know, there was there was a lot of things that changed for us, especially after you know, after the Great Depression and, you know, the way that that this country rebounded so quickly, that that time period, American history, I'm, I'm drawn to movies during that time. Shawshank, you know, it, it's just it, it's just a great story. I, I think the fact that they uh, they made Andy swim or crawl through 300 yards of sewage it was exactly how much he wanted Ooh, freedom. Yeah. I just saw that movie for the first time, maybe six months ago. It's actually my boss's favorite film. Uh, you know, as I work at a theater and her and I were talking and I was like, you know, that's one I just somehow have never seen. So I finally sat down and watched it. And I was like, like you said, that, that era, the depression and post depression and the economy coming back. I, I love those older historical films and, and the, and anything Stephen King does, I, I tend to tend to enjoy as well, but it was, it was wonderfully shot. And Frank Darabont, 
did a wonderful job with that. Uh, I ended up buying that in the Green Mile together because oh, yeah. I was like, I need to sit down. I want to watch both of these again. And, and it's uh, um, it, it's it was uh, really amazing. Film. And like I said, you know, because I loved that story. I actually, I think Castle Rock, I think is actually on. It is on Hulu. It's a Stephen King written. They've done two seasons so yeah. far. It, it's it really is so well done it's inspired by all of his work like it's kind of like mashed up and they like yep. bounce off each other with different parts of different stories and it, it, it's something that has piqued my interest but I, I again i keep forgetting about it and other series pop up like uh the <laughs> series that's based on your number five favorite movie oh I, that good. one i i know i do Dave, and you Chris still need to watch what we do in the like, shadows uh, two weeks ago i think it was he texted me about it talking about the show he watched um, and the yeah. movie it's based off. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'll watch it. It sounds great. I just, you know. Not, you've not seen any of it yet? Not the movie nor the television no, show? No. Out of all the movies, I've, like, seen yeah. bits and pieces of it. I just haven't fully watched it. Like, Shawshank, like, I see it. It comes on occasionally, like, AMC or TCM. And I see it, but it's always, like, halfway through the movie. I'm like, I, I, I need to watch it from the beginning. But this one, I had no idea what it was about. Nothing about it. Never heard of it. It is... I, you know, I was so skeptical. I was so skeptical about the show coming out because I, I was just scared that it wouldn't live up to to the movie itself. You know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, you know, amazing, amazing book. I, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know, again, classic, great movie. Of course, with the exception of Keanu Reeves trying to hold off a uh, British accent through the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was I like, you know, your dude, notes here too. I was, I, I was even impressed with Renona Ryder, uh, Winona Ryder in that. I really was, uh, I, but we'll talk about that later. But in this show itself, in this movie, I, one of my favorite characters is Vladislav the Poker instead of Vlad the Impaler. I just thought that, that's, I don't know who came up with that name. Just God, the comedic timing from front to back is just so brilliant i, I just I, I'm, I'm excited for you gabe yeah yeah he was telling me that i had the movie it's like one of his favorite movies and then now they have like a uh, series on amazon prime uh if i'm not mistaken i didn't realize that it was a movie so you know as i join on the co-host and listen to the past uh, podcast i like start writing down like movies all right you know i have uh, we have at least until june so maybe i'll sit down and watch the movies <laughs> Well, it's it's cool for me because um, in the uh, in the television series, uh, there's a, a British actor. His name's Matt Barry. Oh yes, he's oh, my he, favorite. Yes, Laszlo, he is so he, good. He was on <laughs> um, one of my favorite BBC shows years ago called The IT Crowd, mm. which is also on Netflix. And, oh yeah, um, just he's he is so funny. If you've seen any of it. Colin, the character Colin Robinson on the television show. Let's face it, yeah. we have all worked with a Colin. <laughs> I tell my wife that I feel like I'm Colin sometimes. And while I'm telling her that, you just see the energy drain away and I just like <laughs> smile and laugh yeah, and my eyes yeah. go blue. I, you know, like, it was my daughter that working. actually got me into what we do in the shadow. She was, Dad, you've got to watch this with me. And uh, and we watched it and I, I was instantly hooked on this. I think it's written incredibly well. Again, I, I think the scripting, the direction, it, it's just, it's perfect. Taika Waititi has been known for wonderful films. Of course, he just recently did Jojo Rabbit. But he and Jermaine Clement, who are two of the three vampires in the film, directed. And Jermaine and Taika worked with each other on that HBO yeah. series in the early 2000s called Flight of the Concords. And so if you're familiar with that brilliant wit humor that they, you know, they were bringing from New Zealand. That's kind of where some of that, like, got off the, got off. And they had done, they did a short movie, maybe about eight to ten years before the the feature film came out. I want to say after Flight of the Concords happened, they did the short. And everyone who's in the short, the three vampires, um, the main ones, Deacon, Vladislav, and Iago, uh, they were in the short, and they crowdfunded. And even got, you know, the New Zealand film uh, crew, or I forgot what the name is, involved in it. And they were able to fund the film. And then they were able to get it imported to the States. 
And it hit a few of like the art cinemas, like the Indian in Orlando had it. And my wife and I wanted to go see it, but we never did. Uh, they actually played the trailer for it. It was right after Bowie passed away and they did a uh, Bowie week with the man who fell to earth and labyrinth. And we ended up catching one of the showings of labyrinth yeah. and they yeah. played the trailer. Yeah. And I was like, this looks hysterical. And we ended up buying the Blu-ray without seeing the movie when it came out. I bought, I was at Best Buy like the day it came out and like they had two on the shelf. Yeah. That's how rare this movie was going to be. Two on the shelf. And I grabbed it and we watched it once and it was great. And then we watched it again. And I can't find a moment when I'm not quoting this freaking movie. I, I it's, it's comedic genius. And it's so funny. And just the timing and, and of course, the accents because they're from New Zealand. But the way that they're pronunciating things and they're over pronunciating things. And you could see how much fun they had with it. And. It was just genius. And like you said, uh, when you're saying that you're yeah. scared how the show was going to translate, I was the same way. And, and then I thought that they were attached on production, writing and direction side of the show. And I knew I was like, oh, I got faith in them. And first season was just hilarious. And it's to the point where my wife and I, season two just started a, c a couple uh, weeks ago. Uh, every Wednesday night, because in the movie, uh, they're eating, they feed the version of spaghetti to lure them in, and they call it Baschetti. We actually make spaghetti on Wednesday nights to watch what we do in the shadows. It's become, an, it's become that popular in our home that we just, it's, it's so funny. It, it really is. I got to give them a shout out. I'm sorry, because uh, they probably made the funniest movie I've ever seen in my entire life. There will never be another mockumentary like that one. I, I don't think you can really it's, top it's, that movie. It, you know, it's a it combination a of, of a comical vampire movie and frat house. I, it's, it's just so yeah. cool. <laughs> I love the... I, House meetings. Yes. And I love how they, they realize that they're they're being filmed and they have a camera crew. And, and even on the show, it showcases that they'll go places and do things and their environment, like uh, they'll they'll be in a bar and someone will be like, what's with the camera crew? And it's just, just the most random, oh, yeah. like it, it's so self-aware and it's just oh, it's so full. It's so funny. It is so funny. Gabe, you need to watch it, man. I'm telling it's you. It's a vampire it's, version of the it's office. One of the best. Okay, <laughs> see, you know, that's all you had to say. Once you throw it, <laughs> compare it to the office, then, then that's it. I'm sold. Then if I'm I gonna, know I actually say. have to leave the podcast and go watch it right now. I'll see you guys later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. I got pulled from up. getting pulled to another Dave attraction game. Is that what watch the movie. <laughs> Alright, I will. I will. I will. Jack, we're going to go into our segment around the track. And what we do is we take the top one or top two of your, your genre picks and we kind of reimagine Great Movie Ride and have some fun. Let's so do it. We're going to let's do it. And <laughs> I, I, I have never seen I've seen your, your first musical. As we as we roll in the musical, I've seen the movie, but I've always wanted to experience it. They play it at movie theaters, like art house theaters, and have live actors create like doing oh, the, or playing the play or, or acting out the play, I guess, in front of you while they're doing the movie. And I've never got to experience that, but the Rocky it, Horror it Picture is, Show, yeah, it's, it's one of my top favorite five. musical. What about Rocky Horror Picture Show? Just so, Nails so, it on you know, the, I mean, and the I remember, for you, I guess. We I'm say. old enough that I remember going, you know, to a drive in to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time. And, and you know, we're, we're in, God, was that mm -hmm. 19, 1972 or 73 Chevy Bel Air? It was my grandfather's. And uh, my brother was mad because he had to bring his bring me and I'm, I'm eight years younger. He had his girlfriend with him and uh, yeah, he was not happy, but <laughs> I remember sitting there. In, I remember sitting there in the front of the car while they were in the back and I'm sitting there, I'm eating my popcorn and it started raining right at the beginning of the movie. So the whole thunderstorm, the way that it all starts up and they're, you know, they're, the car breaks down and they go up to the gate. I felt like I was, I was living the whole thing out. I, I really, it was just, it was kind of cool. Um, oh, wow. You know, when you, you look at the movie and you, you know, you start hearing the music, the music was um, pretty inspirational to me as far as stylistically. I always, you know, that, mm -hmm. that the music really resonated with me. It was, it was big. It was bold. Um, they, you know, 
Listen, let's face it. The majority of us, if we've ever been involved in any high school um, thespian group or, or musical group, everybody's done or at least discussed doing time warp at one time in, in <laughs> or another. Yes. You know, I've been you there. Know, love that show, but Tim Curry became one of my all-time favorite actors in that movie. You know, you, yeah. you look at his career, you look at people like Barry Bothwick, who was in the movie, um, Susan Sarandon, you know, the, these people, God, what careers they went on to have, but Tim Curry was always, to me, just, he, he made the movie for me. Oh, and 100%. I, yeah. And I could never pull off black patent leather high heels like that, no matter <laughs> The first time I saw this, it wasn't at the movies. I saw it later down the road, like the movie itself. But Universal for Horror Nights for like four or five years, they put on a tribute show. And it was not like the full stage show, but it was like a, a shortened version. And it was very much like those uh, like those movies that, that Chris is talking about where the crowd interacts. And it's like, damn it, Janet. And, you know. Yeah. And all that stuff. You know, when they do the toast, they, they throw toast, they throw bread. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. great. It's crazy. The following too. And, you know, and I'm, I'm a huge like musical person and love musicals. You know, you have at the bottom here, like for the record, no two Broadway shows should ever be made into a movie unless you're going to use the Broadway cast in the movie. And, and I agree. Cause you know, you've, you've had these movies where they like, change up the cast and you're like, oh, it's not as good as the Sage Show. And and to me, the Sage Show will never be beaten by a movie just because the, the live yeah. aspect of theater is what draws me to theater so much. But the, just the following, so many years after, because it came out in 1975 and we're here, you know, uh, 45 years later and it still has a huge following. And it's just one of those movies that just like sticks with everybody and everybody, yeah. like even the first time I went there, like people started screaming along and then as the show went on, I started following along and I'm like, oh, okay, I get what they're saying. I know when to say, I know the cue and I could like follow along. And it's just very interactive, very fun, a very, very fun twist on musicals. It was, the, it was the first version of, it was the beta test for cosplay. I mean, you know, really, I, I you know, it, 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 people, yeah, started, yeah. people started dressing up to go to that, you know, the same year it came out. That's awesome. Well, I've I've always wanted to go to one of those, and I know they paint the big oh, yeah. red V on your forehead if it's your first time going because you're a virgin to the show. And I know all about it because back when I lived in Georgia, we had one at the uh, the Plaza Theater in Atlanta, and uh, I had a lot of friends who would go often, and I just I never did. And it's not that I didn't want to; I just I just never went. Do you have a scene from Rocky Horror that you would put on like a particular? Scene from the movie that would be ride centric, I guess. To you, wow. <laughs> I don't know. If not, we could we could talk one about other movies because this may not be the perfect right? Disney esque, right? You know, scenes. Yeah, I. You know, I think I. <laughs> I think we may want to avoid putting one of any of those scenes. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know what? I think like <laughs> you know, time yeah, warp. Yeah, maybe the, you know and, time and, warp would be. Yeah, good. but yeah, what do you replace? Because wow, such a. Uh, well, you're just you're just putting it there. Okay, We're good. not theoretically replacing. <laughs> We're just saying it's there, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <don't> get me wrong. <laughs> and uh, your next one on your list because there's multiple musicals in that section of the ride. Uh, we'll talk about Hairspray for a moment. Are you referring to the '88 uh, John Waters both. version uh, or the 2007? Yeah, Adam this is version? this is cool for me. You know, the whole set is in Baltimore, Maryland, gotcha. which I'm a Marylander. You know, I remember I, I remember when they were shooting uh, the movie in Baltimore, uh, some of the streets that they had closed off. Again, you know, such great character development in all of this. I, I think. You know, more people know about about the movie, you know, with with John Travolta and everybody. What what I really love about it is they stayed so true to the diction and the and the dialect of of the way that people speak in Baltimore. It is so spot on. Travolta does an amazing job at that because you don't say hun, you say horn. <laughs> you don't have a glass of water. You have a glass of water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! Uh, um, do you have a scene from I, Hairspray that you, you know? Would put on? I, I think the, the dance, uh, the song in the in uh, when um, Tracy's mom and dad are dancing together. I would just uh, want to add a segment of that 
into mm -hmm. uh, into GMR somewhere because I just thought that was so. Uh, I think the song's called uh, "You're Priceless to Me." I think is the name of the song. It just it's it's sweet. It's cute. It's yeah. It's just really awesome. I love that one too. Um, you talked about like John Travolta being great That's at one it, but in oh, that sorry, scene, I mean, who would you have play Edna? Would you have John Travolta or the you know the great Harvey Firestein? Uh, Harvey, yeah. I mean, you gotta... I, of course. I mean, I I didn't want to assume, but you know. But I think from the newer movie, you gotta have Christopher Walken. <laughs> oh, of course, of <laughs> course. <laughs> Well, we're going to go into mob crime. Your first four, Jack, have already been mentioned on the show. And just to keep some sense of variation, a Bronx Tale is your number five. And we haven't discussed that one on the show. So I'd like to okay. talk about that um, one for a moment, if you uh, don't mind. It came out in, uh, I think, 93, 92 or 93. You know, it was, it was funny for yeah, me 93. because, you know, especially after Goodfellas and stuff like that, you always you always see De Niro as the mobster, and in this one, he was he was just an Italian mm -hmm. dad wanting to keep his son straight and out of trouble. Uh, of course, uh, Chaz and I can never pronounce his last name right. Palamentary. I I wouldn't know either, so you're good. I think that's played, I think that's right. Yeah, he plays Sonny. He plays the mob. Yeah, Palamentary. And okay. um and there is just this this one scene. You know, I mean, there's a lot of cool scenes with the character Sonny and, and the young boy. But you know, he's telling him, you know, if if going on this date, you know, if you let her in the car and while you're walking around, if she doesn't reach over and unlock the door for you, she's not worth it. Of course, this goes way back before power locks <laughs> or remote entry. But but you know. That kind of relationship was was kind of cool, um, but there is this one scene. Oh my gosh, it's just it's the best scene. So you know, funny every every mob mob movie they've they've got their club or a bar, and they're there, and all of a sudden, you know, he walks out of this one mm -hmm. restaurant, and um, there's this motorcycle gang that's that's coming into his town and they all go down past making all sorts of noise in this nice quiet little neighborhood and all the bikes park and they go into their bar so Sonny goes down there and um you know a, a little conversation uh ensues and they're talking you know uh the guy goes listen we just we just want to be we just want beers for everybody and we'll leave and uh he goes okay then you'll leave and um, so they all get their beer and they turn around and shake the beer and they throw the beer on the bartender. Wrong thing to do. So the character, Sonny, he goes over and he, t he tells, he tells <laughs> this guy, you know, something really quiet in the ear, whispers in his ear. And then he walks to the door and he pulls the door closed and he locks it from the inside. And he turns around and looks at all of there. There's, you know, 18 bikers in this bar and he's standing there and he looks at him. He goes, mm -hmm, see, now you can't leave. And uh, and in that moment, the look on these this biker gang, these guys faces was like, uh oh. And all of a sudden, the rest of the rest of Sonny's crew comes rolling in from the back. They just absolutely wear the ever living snot out of these guys. It is it is such a great scene. Watch the movie just for that scene if you want to. But there's a lot of cool scenes in this. That sounds like iconic for that movie. And I didn't know De Niro directed this too. Of course, Joe Pesci's in it. You know. You got De Niro, you got Pesci, you got Goodfellas. Oh, yeah, because uh, was actually I do one have of my favorite that. movies, and we talked about it on my episode. But yeah, another like great movie, and we talked, yeah, we talked about that, like how it's you know De Niro, Pesci, like oh, yeah. all all of them are just like you think of mob movies, and you can't throw a rock without hitting one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I you know I, I do have to talk about Goodfellas for a second. One scene where they're all sitting around the table, and um, sure, sure, and. Pesci's telling his story, and um, Henry Hill, his char the, the character Henry Hill, he goes, you're a funny guy. And the way Pesci pulls that in and starts just hounding him, what, I make you laugh? What, I'm I'm funny? I'm, I'm a joke to you? And, and the whole, the babbling. Oh, God, the babbling was so uncomfortable. And the stuttering. And then, I almost had you. I almost had you. I just love that movie. I love that scene. That's the one where we get the yeah. infamous Ray Liotta laughing his eyeballs out of his head gif. <laughs> he looks like his eyes are about to pop out of his head. He's laughing. Now, I, uh, Goodfellas is great. It, it's, it ranks right up there. 
this is sounding like a bandit show to me. So we are going to go into Western uh, because I want to talk about the man with no name who has taken two of your top spots for Western, Clint Eastwood and the good, the bad and the ugly. And of course, your next one is Fistful of Dollars uh, for a few dollars more is uh, the third one. And I have only seen the good, the bad, was, the ugly uh, it, once when I was, it was maybe a kid. It was one of the first kid. Westerns I ever saw at the movie theater also. It was, um, you know, that was that was my first time actually seeing Clint Eastwood in anything. And I just, I mean, the squint. Yeah. Oh, the squint. It was just, I mean, it lit you on fire. It went right through you. To, to GMR's credit, you know, Clint had that look inside GMR. I mean, it was it was spot on. See, it's crazy oh, yeah. because like, uh, and we and we talked about it on my podcast and my and my westerns were a little bit different. Um, but I am not like very familiar with the western movie, and I feel terrible, especially being a banded trainer. But like, I I think this is one of the the sections of uh, this podcast that I like the most because we get to talk about those movies and why people love it, and then I get to just add it to the list. Yeah. You definitely should, and and the Man with No Name trilogy is Sergio Leone. It, it, it's it's if you think westerns, uh, of course John Wayne, but if it, then you go to like the spaghetti westerns like this, it's iconic, and they're they're just classic. And like you were saying, the squint, like it, it's almost like he's looking at you with this this sense of fire in his eyes. Oh, it's intense. Now I need I still need to see Fistful of Dollars. And I still need to see for a few dollars more. And I haven't seen Good, Bad, and the Ugly since for what I can remember. So I don't remember much. So I, I just oh, need okay. to watch all of them. But I remember Clint Eastwood for The Outlaw Josie Wales. My dad, when I was growing up, got me into Josie Wales quite a bit. Uh, again, I, it was when I was a kid. But I, I was more familiar with that storyline than the man with no name. So I, I've always liked Clint Eastwood's movies whenever he's done them. Unforgiven would always be on TBS growing up and I, I would watch whatever was on. I never see the whole, saw the whole thing. These are definitely ones I want to go back for. It's nice because this, I think this might be the first time we've actually had Clint Eastwood. Uh, we're going to talk about putting a, 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 a part of one of his movies on the ride. And we've always <laughs> either talked about John Wayne hey, or if you want to get into Gabe's episode, right Back here? to the Future uh, Part 3. That was his favorite <laughs> <laughs> which we laugh about jokingly, but seriously, is he, he like you said, he well, doesn't watch a lot of westerns so out of it his movie been worse. love. It that been was city his, slickers. his favorite westerns. <laughs> I give him a little bit of crap. I mean, the the second one wasn't followed up. Oh uh, my god, that much better. Uh, Five O goes west. That was my uh, second. That, yeah. <laughs> no, this is a no judgment zone game. Perfect. Hey man, perfect. That's, why, that's that. why I'm here. <laughs> well, we're judging. I mean, we're little, judging. We're just not going to do it judgment. on here. We'll when we get it. off, then we'll start talking about it. <laughs> oh, so it's like when I worked at Movie Right, everybody just judged me backstage. Gotcha. <laughs> Every time I the oh, building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have a scene? And, and, and since we're talking about Good, Bad, and the Ugly and Fistful of Dollars a little bit, what scene would you uh, would you take? I mean, we already have Clint on the ride, but do you have a particular... I uh, love, scene that you love from that, I guess, love. trilogy. When, when, um, God, I forget the actor's name too. At the end of the movie, it's uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's it's when he he's up on the um, he's got him hanging, and he's and he's there on the uh, the wooden cross, the wooden uh, tombstone, and just you know he's sitting there watching Eastwood. Yeah. Right away, and I'm and, and I remember watching that movie, going, oh, "What's going to happen? What's what's?" No, you can't leave it like this. No. When he reappears and fires the shot, I just, I love, I love that scene. I would love to have that scene in GMR. That would be interesting too, because you could almost, like you said, yeah, the, 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 the feeling you had when you thought that was it, you could almost pull like that, I guess a twist, I guess you could say. Or the, the suspense yeah. of, is he coming back? Of course, for the first time riders, they'll know it if they ride multiple times. But you could almost pull that uh, in a cinematic sense on the ride, too, and that would be fun. Well, we're going to take a, uh, a break, and Dave Fesky is going to take us for a little bit of a, a bandit ride here. And we'll be right back on the Great Movie Radio Show. Hold it right there, hombre. Woo! -wee! You're listening to the Great Movie Radio Show starring Chris and Gabe, which means you hit the mother love. Don't any hombres move until we come back. <laughs> Unless you want a belly full of lead. <laughs> I 
Warning, remain on this podcast. The advertisement you are experiencing is extremely dangerous. Proceed with caution. Autumn Star Entertainment is an independent producer of movies and video. Their goal is to provide Hollywood-level entertainment for low to no budget. Check them out on Facebook.com slash Autumn Star Entertainment or on Twitter at Autumn Star ENT. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss another episode of the Great Movie Radio Show starring Chris and Gabe. When you do, it means you're riding with us now, so hold on to your horses. Speaking of which, where are the horses? Hi there, Great Movie Radio Show fans. My name is Dalton Burdett, and I'm here to tell you about the Movie Nights. Well, what are the Movie Nights? The Movie Nights are a small production company out of Orlando, Florida, responsible for award-winning short films, podcasts, and a variety of movie-loving content. And we are also new partners of the Great Movie Radio Show. So, for some more movie-loving content that you guys will probably enjoy, please head over to our YouTube channel, Movie Nights, and you can find the exact link at youtube.com slash c slash movie nights and also be sure to listen to our podcast hosted by me and my partner ryan warner on spotify youtube apple podcasts and google play and yes movie nights is spelled with a k because we think we're clever hey gabe what we got an electronic letter a fancy smancy email from who? yeah from trainer troy he says hey just a big thanks guys for the show You're the first podcast I've listened to all the way through. Love the anniversary episode. GMR is near and dear, and it's so nice to hear so many others who loved it too. Thanks. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the love, Troy. We have fun uh, recording these episodes, especially now that I jumped up as co-host. Yes, Troy, thank you so much for the kind letter, and we hope you enjoy our future episodes. We just wanted to say hello and thanks. Thanks! That's a mighty fine territory you're heading into, Pilgrim. Time to get back to the great movie radio show starring Chris and Gay. I wouldn't think about turning back if I was you. That is, if you want my opinion. We're back. So we just left Western, and we're right, about to jump into sci-fi. Uh, this is one movie we haven't talked about. Um, or Chris has talked about previously in episodes, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. What makes it spo- so special to you and, and like stick out as a sci-fi movie? I, you know, okay, so I, I again, I remember, I remember the theater I went to to see this movie. You know, Spielberg. I don't think there's nothing that hasn't been said about this man as a director. Just incredible story. The way that the story comes to life. I've absolutely always loved Richard Dreyfus. He made Jaws for me. I, I absolutely, you know, absolutely loved it. Um, oh, but, yes. You know, when, oh, I, yes. when, I, when I watched that movie um, as, as a kid, uh, you know, we're talking 1977. I was 10 years old when this movie came out. What kid didn't want to break a window in the back of their house and start throwing dirt into the living room <laughs> and building their monster dirt tower in the middle. I mean, that was like, you know, I remember watching it going, oh, is that something only adults get to do? I can't wait to be an adult so I can do that. <laughs> you know, the special effects were so cool. And I I know now when I watch it on oh, my one TV, you know, I could see, it, you can kind of see the, the patching around, you know, the spaceship when it comes into scene at, at the end. You, you can look and you can see the, pixels a little bit just so like they're not <laughs> quite right. but it doesn't matter it was just you know it was just such a cool movie it, it made me never want to live out in middle america in a farm field that's where all bad things happen i mean <laughs> yes <laughs> no it, it, you know the special effects again <laughs> we all could sit here and everybody in the world if you do if you go da 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 everybody in the world knows what that's from it's just you know you'll never forget it well i can definitely tell you that i've never seen close encounters of the third kind and i feel horrible because it's one of the few movies i haven't seen (laughs) 
and I don't know how I have it. Oh, trust me. And I and I plug it a lot. And we actually uh, the movie list that you submit us all the guests. I put them on this app called Letterboxd, and it's out of New Zealand. And it's like a social media site for movies. And so you can like add to your watch list or what you just watched and rate it and review it and comment on other reviewers. And it's a wonderful tool for someone like me who is like, I've recorded almost 1600 movies on this app and I have a list of maybe like 400 movies that I haven't seen yet. And I'm constantly adding to it. So anytime anyone, uh, when we have a guest on, I'll, I'll put their list on there and I take their list and I, I actually transfer movies I haven't seen to my watch list and it, it helps me keep up with it that way. But it's a wonderful tool. We actually, after your episode comes out, we're going to be putting some of your lists on Letterboxd. So people who listen to us, if they want to click on and, and see the movies we're talking about, maybe they haven't seen Close Encounters like I haven't. It's, it's like you said, Jack. You just... Da, da, da. <laughs> like, I've never I've never seen it, but I know that scene. And I, I, could, you know, I hear that song and I picture it and I know exactly what scene it is. I just don't know what happened before or after that scene. There's a scene in that movie where uh, Dreyfus is in his, his work truck and he's at this railroad crossing. Some of the spaceships start coming close and everything starts going crazy. His car dies, all the energy sucked out of it. And all of a sudden the, the railroad crossing lights are shaking and the gates going up and down. That would have been the scene that I would have put into GMR. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. And that, I think that would be like nice. with Alien, like it was very dark, but also it had a lot of like lights and features and little stuff like that. So they put something like that in the in movie ride and just like you like round the corner and it's just like all lit up and you mm-hmm. see that. I think, you know, while we're not really replacing the ride, that would be a cool scene to quote unquote yeah. replace it. Yes. Very. The light techs would really enjoy designing. <laughs> very luminous. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Lots of uh, light bulbs. So we're going to dive into the next part of the ride, the uh, action adventure and all James Bond movies. And I'm I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. And, uh, no, and, and your favorite was, to, yeah, like Chris said, your all favorite was <laughs> Timothy Dalton. Except, except yeah, Timothy uh, Dalton. Just for the record, um, you guys out there can't see my list, but I gave my top five James Bond movies. I also put a six line on there that says, and then every other James Bond film, as long as it wasn't any with Timothy Dalton. <laughs> I liked him better. So you than liked Dolph? George Lazenby I mean, because you know, you're one of the few. Yeah, if you did, God, it. I just couldn't. Uh, I had to turn off Lazenby halfway we'll, through. I'll, I'll it's the only James it. Bond I haven't seen the whole thing through. I like giving Lazenby crap, but no, no, he could just put this section with just every James Bond and like scenes from all the Bonds and this, and not yeah. just one particular. Yeah, uh, with the everyone, with the exception of Timothy Dalton, and all you see is Dalton's every Bond on the ride, and then you get to you know, you Timothy get Dalton. To that's that's when Dalton. you shoot him. Well, I, that's it. I, I, that's where it ends. I got a question for you. I got a couple <laughs> of questions for you. So, first of all, who's your favorite Bonds? Oh boy! Oh my God! It would have to be between Daniel Craig and Sean Connery. Daniel Craig has just knocked the current Bond out of the park, and and there's so much more action oriented. I mean, they were there was great action in the older movies, but he he's almost reinvented Bond, kind of like almost Christian Bale. Kind I won't say reinvented Batman, but he bought a new, he brought a new present. There was a new take on Batman. It's cinematically. And I feel that Daniel Craig has been, has the, the movies have been the spirit of James Bond, but they've been so much more than just a spy movie. I've really loved him, but, but Sean Connery's classic. I, I forgot which one it is. I, I want to say it was, uh, you only live twice, but he's him and his, one of his cohorts are hanging outside this villain hideout. And it's, it, there's this billboard with this woman's face. He's going to escape and they're out there waiting for him to escape. And the mouth of the woman on the billboard opens and there's this escape hatch. And he has that pistol that's kind of like rigged into a sniper rifle. And he leans it on his on the buddy's shoulder. And as this guy's climbing out of the mouth and escaping, he snipes him and the guy falls to his death. And, and he says, and I'm going to butcher the quote. But it's and if you think about it, it's completely sexist. But I love the wit and the humor. That'll teach her to keep her mouth shut. And I was just hysterically laughing about that moment. Uh, it was it was the the cheese, the classy cheese of the Bond, the the, the Sean Connery Bond era that really Dave, loves, how about you? Uh, uh, helps so, me love him. As, I, we're going to have Bond. one in common. I, I uh, obviously, so Sean Connery. Um, 
you know, your top movie, I was telling Chris earlier, I see that movie come on all the time. And no matter where it's at, Dr. No, yeah. And every time it comes on, I have to watch it. Like, I watch it and I just, I love it. Dr. So no. Sean Connery's the top. I'm not going to lie. It took, it's taken me a little while to get into Daniel Craig. Uh, when I first watched Casino Royale, I didn't really care for it. Um, but now that I'm like, uh, no Time to Die is about to come out. Started watching it and started getting into it. But when I really started watching the James Bond movies was the Pierce Brosnan days. So he's his number two on my list. I find a lot of people that 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 did like Brosnan. Oh, I you know I grew I. up with him on a television show called Remington Steel. And um and you know I, I remember watching him there. Yeah, uh, the Remington Thomas Steel. Crown Affair. Yes. I lo- I love that movie. I think it was it, it's it's again. There's a lot of people that really don't like the movie at all. They hated the storyline. I would argue that all day long. I, I just it's a guilty pleasure movie for me. But, you know, for me, Chris, I, I, I do have to tip my hat. I, too, am Sean Connery and Daniel Craig. I watched Dr. No right before we got on today. <laughs> and then I watched um, You Only Live Twice before that. Nice. Last night I watched Diamonds Are Forever. Oh, There's so much to talk about with James Bond. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a huge Daniel Craig fan. I Sean Connery will always be my favorite, but I think you know Connery was a typical to again men in that time in the world. They weren't respectful the way that they they were. So I think they filmed it very accurately. And number two, Bond was a manipulative jerk that was going to do whatever he had to do to get what he wanted, even if it meant yep. roughing up anyone, including women. And you saw that in Dr. No, you saw that in You Only Live Twice, all of those older oh, yeah. Bond movies. Now, Daniel Craig has not, they've, they've been very smart about it, and and I, I think they, they should not draw attention to it any longer. I, I think it's a horrible thing. For the record, I think any man who beats a woman is a weak human being, and I have nothing for them. I think Craig has brought back the edginess that that we lost with Roger Moore. Robert Roger Moore was a more flamboyant Bond. It was the softer side of Bond. You know, then we had the Dark Ages there with with Timothy Dalton. <laughs> oh God! Uh, dark even ages. the storylines. I mean, God. at least it was only two movies. But um, I'm I'm not really <laughs> passionate about it at all. So I'm sitting there, and you know, and then we go through the Pierce Brosnan, in which Pierce started bringing it back a little bit. He was he was he was kind of edgy, and then you know, then when Daniel Craig came on the scene, with the exception of oh God, what was the yeah Casino Royale Royale, and then was what was the second one? I keep forgetting getting that quantum of souls i i i I didn't like that one a whole bunch but skyfall i loved i think it showed it showed the human side of bond specter continued on that specter has jumped up there to be a Mm. really great movie for me uh for a couple of reasons i thought the theme song i I, it's one of my all-time favorite movie tracks the song was so well done but now the big question what part or what movies, you know, what are you going to put in the ride for, like, you know, maybe where uh, Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark was? What would you, like, put there based on your action adventures? I I envision um, a Bond uh, scholarship pageant. I envision having representation of all of the enemies, all of the villains that Bond has ever faced, and then uh, pay homage to all of the Bonds, including Timothy Dalton, because he was a Bond. <laughs> but then, but then I, you know, I, I love. I, I think one of the things that that made the Bond movie so cool for me was the vehicles. The, uh, oh, in, in every vehicle. the boat the car, cars, yeah. the DB five. I mean, come on, it's the greatest car that's ever been created when when we were in london a couple of years ago there was I, I, we're walking through one of these marketplaces and there's a sign there and it said bond in motion and i lost my mind and i went in and it's it's a museum with all of the automobiles and all of the motorcycles and the the crocodile um uh, the croc sub that uh, roger moore was in and the the th- the Honda three wheel trikes were in there. Oh that, wow! Uh, 
that Sean Connery had. But but the coolest thing, they had the Rolls Royce um, Silver Cloud that Roger Ooh. Moore was in. And, and they had that car there. And they also had Goldfinger's Rolls Royce there. Oh, nice. and. And then they had the um, the Ashton Martin that uh, they set the Guinness Book of World Records in uh, in the flip in uh, Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the uh, that, the scene at night. Yep, they had that that busted up car in there also. It was <laughs> oh, the busted up one, not just the. Oh wow! They they also had uh, one of the original um, uh, DB fives that Sean Connery drove in um, Doctor No. They had yeah. one of those there. That's awesome. That'd be really interesting to have in the ride too, just like because you know the ride really focuses on more on like certain scenes and stuff, but like an homage to the Bond movies because there's so many and so many different actors, and like you said, even Timothy Dalton. But yeah, I, it'd be a it'd be a merge it'd be a merge of the old backlot tour. True. Almost. Yeah. Um. So we're gonna dive into what my second favorite movie genre. Chris, what movie did we want to talk about? I can't remember. Uh, we're going to talk about The Shining, man. The Shining. Oh. 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 Bow, Shining. Great bow, movie. Bow, bow. Yep. Um, oh, Jack. It's <laughs> such a great movie. And uh, I can't remember. I think it was two years ago. They did it at Halloween Horror Nights. And uh, yes, they it, did. And I oh, missed it. It was, it was so, so good and such a like. It was well done, man. I'm, Universal. Knock the ball out of the park with that house. So, uh, so let's talk about the movie itself. Like, what do you love about it? Oh God, it, it's it. This is going to sound so corny. Everything. <laughs> oh no, that's that's, abs- that's the answer. That is the answer. There, there is there is nothing wrong with any any scene in that entire movie. Everything sets everything up. Everything supports everything. It is just, I don't know where they filmed that. I really don't know that. There is, there's a resort up in, uh, up in Canada. It's called Banff Springs. And the road that goes in there, you can either drive up or you can either, or take a train. And uh, they say during the winter, the roads are impassable. And I thought, my God, that that's exactly what they were dealing with. You're up in the Canadian Rockies. You're out in the middle of nowhere. You get snowed in. It was just to to watch how Nicholson took that character and how it just started breaking down. I mean, just just started to just oh falling apart. Well, he was already broken, and that was part of it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. the The cool thing in that movie, and it goes back to what I talked about with Clint Eastwood. It's the eyes. It's you know Eastwood's eyes in any movie. Anytime he ever lit a cigar in a western. Those eyes are the steely eyes. But when you look at Nicholson's eyes, when he just starts absolutely going over the edge and has just given it all up, the um, zoom, when they do a close up on him and they zoom in him, his eyes, you believe that this man is about to do some bad, bad things. You just know (laughs) it's there. And, and I mean, I, re- I remember watching that. There, there's a few horror movies that I have remembered in my life where I was, what I was doing when when I watched those. The Shining is one of them. Halloween uh, and Friday the Thirteenth. Oh. Two weeks after I watched Friday the Thirteenth for the first time, I went to a summer camp in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Nope. Nope. Camp. Nope. 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 <laughs> <laughs> nope, you saw it, then you went to one. Just stop. Uh, Why? And they put and they put my bunk in front of the, the screened window. Oh I didn't sleep for a week. I actually just watched because I, I we have that shutter app and we watched uh I watched the, the last half of Texas Chainsaw last night and then I watched Friday the thirteenth part six. It just it's on their channel and I had never seen it. And just the way he was smashing through the windows in that one. I've never seen it before. Oh, yeah. But going back to The Shining, I mean, just, yeah, God, the elevator, the blood elevator. I mean, just, oh. who, who thought of doing that? It's just so perfect. And again, like, you know, we talked about the music with Close Encounters and the, the, the lines with uh, The Godfather. 
everybody remembers red rum. Everybody mm -hmm. remembers. Rum. Of course. And, and it's hard to say that without doing the voice. You know, you <laughs> just want to get into it. it it's crazy. I, All Every, like, scene is just, like, so memorable. Like you said, the elevator, the red rum, just – just him, just like his face through the broken door. It oh oh gives me chills. Oh I, uh, yeah, I mean, um, and and I think um, I, I think one of the things that gets overlooked in the movie is um, Shelley Duvall. Uh, I have oh, yeah. her Funko Pop literally in this room right now from The Shining. She okay. So most of us, yes, we know her in this movie, and I think she was. The frantic, jittery, perfect cast for this for this role. A lot of us more remember her for Olive Oil with him, Popeye with Robin Williams. I know, and I thought she did great with that, even though the script was horrid. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, I mean, she she just balanced off of Nicholson so well in this movie. But for the record. You know, there are actors that are child actors that they do age well and they look great. Um, the guy that played Chunk in Goonies, he's the most physically fit human being I've seen in a while. Danny Lloyd, who played Danny Torrance, he didn't age well. Oh, he just, he's, he's a teacher he's, now. Or something. Yeah, yeah, he, he didn't he didn't do well. I, you know, there's there's some out there that I go, oh yeah, bless your heart. <laughs> um, well, sadly, neither has uh, neither has Shelley Duvall. I mean, after you know some things through the '90s, she oh, did yeah. that, that. What was that fairy tale TV show? I forgot what it was called. Mm. She uh, she kind of has dropped out of acting. Kubrick had a tendency to not treat her well during the filming. I, I've read stories about and. I still find it crazy that as much of a masterpiece that this movie is, and I've mentioned this on a previous episode, how how much Stephen King didn't like it because of how different they represented Duvall's character in the movie versus her character in the book that he wrote. Wow, I, I never knew that. That's cool. I mean, it's not cool, but it's it's neat to know. Yeah, yeah. King King does not like Kubrick's take on The Shining, even though it's hailed as one of, if not the greatest horror movie of all time there is a dislike from the original you got a scene from the shining you'd put on the ride there's there's a lot of different iconic scenes i would love to see the maze with the snowstorm mm. I, I think oh that would be cool then that would be a great way for our bandit or gangster to get you know lost in the maze and the tour guide comes back out of it oh yeah oh but yes I, there's also that moment of we, we had in the finale movie, wasn't there? There was a snippet. Uh, yeah, he did. Here's Johnny. Oh, yeah. 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 But, you know, the one thing about The Shining, whatever happened to was it like the Burns sisters or the Burns sisters? Uh, yeah. They, Louise and Lisa. They weren't, they weren't twins, were they or were they? I, I want to say that they were sisters, but they weren't exact. They weren't twins. I think one yeah, was I, older than the other, but they looked yeah. fam, they looked similar enough that they were able to pass them off as twins. But they, you know, whatever happened to them? Because uh -huh. I mean, they're they're like my age. I'm I'm trying to look up here real quick just to have the yeah. They were born in '68, and I was born in '67. I think so, they're coming to uh, Spooky Empire, and so is Danny Lloyd. I think they're coming to that Spooky Empire horror uh, convention when quarantine's over and they've rescheduled things there they were planned for it originally and it was supposed to take place this month but uh i heard that they're uh yeah they're trying to do like a shining reunion well universal they did a great job with the girls the appearance of the girls in in the house that's an iconic image too when danny rounds the corner on his big wheel <laughs> and i had that big wheel for the record when i was a little boy and that was the oh, no. big wheel in the world i you know when he rounded that corner and they're standing there i i remember my heart jumping it was just I was like, what? Wait, what? Yeah. God, God great <laughs> Awesome. Um, so we're going to jump into our drama now. Uh, this movie I have seen. Uh, you know, one of the few movies I have. Uh, Schindler's List. Great movie. Yeah. I, Guilty. I still need to see it. Uh, Listen, I am a, um, 
I, like I said, I'm, I'm a huge uh, lover of history. And I believe that, you know, the way I live my life is that you need to understand, you know, not only where you've come from in order to understand better where you need to go. But I think there's a lot of incredible lessons that can be taught by looking at history. The time in our world around World War II is something that I I study, I read on. Um, I, I may have missed my vocation. I should have probably been a history professor, <laughs> but I absolutely just, I, I want to read and study everything that I can about that. I had the honor a few years ago uh, when I was living in uh, Ohio of meeting a survivor of Auschwitz. I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with this man and to hear his story. And I don't think you can ever hear those firsthand accounts and not forever be changed. It was the most amazing thing. At the end of our meeting, he goes, I want you to see something. And he pulls this box out and he flips it open. He goes, I took this off of a German tank that was at Auschwitz. He goes, because I wanted to keep it forever to always remember all of my friends that didn't make it. And it was a Nazi flag with blood on it from oh, wow. when when the camp was liberated. It was a life-changing moment. It really, really was. Oh, man. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's really cool. And, you know, with this being your favorite film in the drama section, what scene would you put in there? Hands down. It, I cry every time I see it. I really do. I fall like a two-year-old that just got his candy taken from him. So I'll take my candy, man. <laughs> the, well, or I cry as an adult who just had his bourbon taken from him. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but the scene at the end when Liam Neeson, when he's getting ready to leave, and they, they want him to flee so that he can maybe survive, mm -hmm. and, and he looks around at everybody, and it's a heavy scene. Yes. And he starts he starts taking off the pin off his lapel and he said, you know, how many could I have gotten for this and his ring? How many could I've gotten for this? And, you know, this is a man who when you look at the novel, which all this was based off, which was called Schindler's Ark, it is truly based on actual events. Of course, Hollywood kind of morphs things sometimes into entertainment uh, to add entertainment value. But this was a man who did all he could do to save as many people as he could. And to see even at that moment that he was like, I could have done more. I could have done more. I, I just, that whole moment there just gets to me in a personal way. Well, as someone who has never seen Schindler's List, I am very tempted to just say, screw you guys, hop off and go watch it. <laughs> That just pulled me in. I felt like I was there. I have it with the intention of watching it. I just haven't gotten around to watch it because there's so many movies to watch. I need to pull that one up the list and prioritize it much more than it has been. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that is. Yeah, and and like you said, it's a very moving scene. Like throughout the movie, movie you see the progression of Liam Neeson's character and his his yeah. growth and understanding, and then just that scene pulls it at the end. Well, there's it's, yeah, you know, I, I'm feeling it. There's two other things about that movie, and I mean, you're you're talking Liam Neeson, Ben Kingsley, Ralph Fiennes. I you know Fiennes' character. In, in that movie was just, I don't know as an actor how you could not play roles like that and how you disconnect from all of those emotions associated with those roles. I mean, you know, how do you play a mass murderer? Hey, they're professionals. This is what they do for a living. I'm glad. I just, I don't know if I could separate just that emotion and having to carry the emotion that goes along with, I, I if I played a role like that, I would have guilt and I didn't do anything, but I would still feel the guilt from. It. Yeah. Oh. Well, since I don't know much about Chandler's list, other than the scenario, we are going to move into uh, animated with Disney's The Hunchback of Notre yeah. Dame, which is a much more tame version of the real story because in Disney fashion we like to make it animated G and for kids when it's completely opposite. Yes we do. Frollo is still one of the creepiest Disney villains of all time. Oh Frollo. I almost said Frodo. A completely different franchise. That's okay. The animator James Baxter who originally drew Quasi sent me a drawn cell 
and it says, Jack, thank you for loving Quasi from James Baxter. And uh, and it's autographed, and it's hanging here in my, in my that's, library. That's awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So what about the movie itself? We won't get into Quasimodo, because like you said, we'll be here for three <laughs> weeks. Yeah. What about the movie for you, I guess? I, You know, again, I'm a history lover, so Paris, even though I have no desire to go to the city whatsoever, <laughs> I love the city. It is historical. It, it really is. But, you know, the movie itself, for me, it's still about the story. It's about the character development. And, you know, the Disney animation is Disney animation. It's It, it does what it does. It does it well. It's always clean. I, I love great animated features. You know, they remind me a lot of just times as being a father and the the stories that my daughter and I would watch together. But the whole thing about the storyline to me was it, it was more about, you know what, we are who we are. We are how we are. Some of us are, are born with things that we can't control. And some of us have developed habits that we can control and choose not to. Uh, again, I know you said not about Quasi, but it does, to me, the movie does go about qu- back to Quasi. Quasi couldn't control who he was, how he was, how he was born, the issues, the things that he was dealing with. But he stayed true to who he was. He came back to it. He tried to, to morph it when Frollo was around. But he ended up standing tall and saying, you know what? You can judge me for the way that I look, but I know how I feel. I know who I am. And this is right and I'm going to stand up for what is right and because he did he had an impact on his society and I just that's why I love that movie that's awesome I mean yeah it has a great story big question of course what scene are you putting in the attack on Notre Dame at the end and the burning and the molten lava that was coming out of the different ports I I think that would be the scene with Quasi standing up on top holding Esmeralda screaming sanctuary nice We'd have to make it a lot more interactive than just a screen with Fantasia. As much as I love that scene on the ride, you could do so much with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You really could. We're going to move into comedy. Now, as we've said on previous episodes, Oz was here. Oz isn't necessarily a comedy, but it's a genre that the ride didn't really go into. And so this is our chance to take comedy and talk about it. But also we have the fun challenge of how can we make a comedy movie an interactive experience? Because uh, 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 Oz was this epic experience where, you know, the tour guide is dissing the witch and we've got all these munchkins everywhere. So there's a lot of moving parts. And how can we take a comedy and make it a lot of moving parts? And I think your favorite comedy, Blazing Saddles, is up to the task, especially the end of that movie, <laughs> the end of that movie. Uh, and there's a part of it in the finale. And I got to say, that is one of the most zaniest Western movies I have ever seen in my oh. life. And I'm a huge fan of the Three Amigos. Watching Blazing Saddles for the first time was a treat. And then when they're like at the end and it's feeling very Magnificent Seven, we built this fake town and we're going to draw them in and then get them. And then it just goes completely sideways into like, you're running out of the studio and you're in another set now. And Dom DeLuise is a director. And I, I was laughing hysterically. And my wife had to calm me down. And let's, but... and let's, all, <laughs> and let's all sing it together. Throw out your hands. Stick out your push. Hands on your hips. Give him a push. You'll be surprised. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the words, but I remember oh the tune. God, oh. it's irreverent. And it makes fun of everything. And, you know, that's that's the thing. I... You know, listen. I I know I know where we're at in in uh, in, in society, and and I don't ever want to do anything that would make anyone uncomfortable or or feel like I'm making yeah. fun of them. Mel Brooks, for some reason, had a way of doing it. I mean, between Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein and the producers, and one of my favorite Mel Brooks movies, uh, the Silent Movie, which is one I still need oh, to see. The only word that spoken in that entire movie is by, by Marcel Marceau as a mime. And, and who, would, <laughs> who would do that? Uh, he speaks one word in the whole movie. That's it. God, high anxiety was fabulous. The history of the world. And I, you know, I could go on and on. Blazing Saddles for me was just this iconic, disrespectful movie that, I, you know, I, I grew up in a very hardcore Pentecostal household. Um, I'm not even sure we were allowed to laugh, but I did. And Blazing Saddles was just that movie when I first rented it on Beta. 
Yes, on Beta. Oh, man. Yeah. I just remember, you know, there, there were so many scenes. Gene Wilder, I love. You know, I mean, we all grew up watching uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factories, which was one of the most disturbing movies I've ever seen. That's a whole <laughs> other discussion. That's a podcast in all its own. For me, there were so many iconic moments when the sheriff pulls the gun on himself. Um, <laughs> Yep. You know, Help me. Shut yeah, up. yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that moment, but there were some some people in that movie, Harvey Corman, who I grew up loving on the Carol Burnett show. He was the best thing about the horrible Star Wars <laughs> holiday special, oh. too. Yes, absolutely. I think it was Comedians in Cars with Coffee with uh, Jerry, Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. He did a, um, he was with Carl Reiner, Mel Brooks one night. They were eating takeout in uh, Carl Reiner's house, which they do quite frequently. It was either on that or it was another interview that Mel Brooks gave. I cannot remember why, uh, but he talked about auditioning Madeline Kahn and he talked about just how perfect she was for her character of Lily von Stuck. I you know I just think back between the the way that they mix all of the cast together with Brooks and Madeline Kahn, Gene Wilder um, I think his name was Cleavon Little, which was Sher- Sheriff uh, yeah. Hart. They had some classic, classic Hollywood stars in there. You you had Dom DeLuise. A lot of people would argue he's not classic, but he was one of my all-time favorite. But Hart oh, yeah. Corman, you had one of my all-time favorite musicians, Count Basie, and his orchestra uh, <laughs> was in that. Uh, John Hillerman, uh, who was Howard Johnson. I just, I just love that movie. Do you got a scene from it out of the numerous <laughs> iconic scenes from that movie that you would that you would take and make such an interactive moment as as Oz was for the Hands original? Hands down, the baked bean campfire scene. I'd have the movie ride vehicles ride through. I'd have horses and cowboys all around, <laughs> and the entire scene would smell like the Stitch ride over at Magic Kingdom when he. Oh. God. In your face. <laughs> no. Oh, man. That would be it. That's awesome. That's, oh, my God. What an experience. Well, we're going to pull it back to Doc, man. We've been talking for quite a while. Jack, it was a pleasure having you on the Great Movie Radio Show. And we'll have you back on soon because we've got more yeah. to talk about. We appreciate you coming on and being part of the podcast. Gabe, you got yeah, anything um, before we Yeah, just like you said, thanks it. for being on here. It was a fun experience in this with you, just like it was experiencing training. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so. Well, guys, it truly has been an honor listening to uh, all the, the movie writers out there. I want you all to know, past or uh, past movie writers or the, the team that was there when I was there it was the greatest experience of my disney career being able to be a part of that attraction with all of you i respect all of you in 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 more ways than you will ever know um and i appreciate all that you all gave to the great movie ride and to guests like me to inspire me to want to come to hollywood studios and and be a part of that incredible life-changing and irreplaceable uh, attraction thank you so much we appreciate it definitely jack thanks for listening to the show again you can listen to us on youtube spotify anchor tons of places we'll have this uh, episode posted on our website as well www.thegmrshow.com this has been the great movie radio show with chris and gabe Hi, we'll see you next time The Great Movie Radio Show is recorded in Orlando, Florida. You can visit our website at www.thegmrshow.com. Art direction and logo design provided by Mr. Bayless. Voiceover and intro work provided by Dave Feske and Joe Erickson. You can find our podcast on multiple platforms such as Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many more. Music provided by the YouTube Audio Library. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search The Great Movie Radio Show or The GMR Show. This has been The Great Movie Radio Show. We hope you enjoy your day, and we'll see you at the movies. The stuff dreams are made of. Goodbye, everyone. You have been listening to a GMR Radio production.